It's not very often that a game demands me to talk about it. Usually, I decide to discuss a game, but this is different. You see, Iconic Class itself compelled me to talk about it because it struck me in such a way that no other game has ever struck me. Sure, Iconoclast has not made a significant impact on the gaming industry, nor is it well known, but what it means to me personally is unparalleled. The themes it delves into are super personal, and not only does it reflect the developer's struggles, but my own. More importantly, it shows that one developer, a single developer, can create an action platformer with so much depth, character, and artistic beauty. In fact, I had no idea a game of this caliber could be this fantastic. It was my first Metroidvania after all. And I had no experience with Super Metroid or Castlevania titles on my initial playthrough. It was this game alone that launched me into this genre at full force. And even after playing some of those titles, this game is first to mind whenever I hear the term Metroidvania, which is ironic considering that it doesn't make up the portmanteau. So before I discuss this game and why I believe it to be so great, I need to thank Joachim Sandberg for providing this gem to the world. Those seven years of work paid off. Also, I must warn you that there are spoilers ahead. If you wish to experience the game entirely blind, I recommend leaving this video and returning later if you want. With that being said, let's dive in! So, Robin, this girl, with a wrench in the magnet shape hairdo, what's her deal? How does she control? What abilities does she have that allows her to traverse the land? Well, I'm happy to inform you that Robin controls great. When you stop, Robin stops. Even with a wireless controller, there's no noticeable delay, and momentum does not carry Robin on when the player is not controlling her, and that complements this game super well. Her jump height is dependent on how long you press the jump button, just a tap or a hold. In addition, you're able to cancel. This means that no animation has to fully play out for you to be able to input another command and for Robin to perform it right away. It's flawless, and it allows for utmost precision. Robin has a few other moves she can pull off. She can grab ledges, this comes into play all over the game. And she can even grab ledges successively, and even wall kick too. She can duck and crawl in small areas, another move used all over the game. She can climb ladders, and she can ground pound. This is useful for breaking certain objects and over stunning enemies. It can lock on too, Super Mario Galaxy style. She can pass through certain platforms too. She can pick up and throw keys and blocks. She can swim in 8 directions with limited breath. Pressing jump repeatedly makes Robin go faster, but this is balanced by a faster decrease in breath. Breath is recovered by servicing. Even more moves are added to her arsenal with tweaks, such as jaw drooling and bomb detonating. Though, tweaks can only be equipped at save points. Tweaks are crafted at tweak crafting tables using the 4 types of materials gathered from chests throughout the game. To get the recipes, you must find schematics. Robin has three main weapons and one wrench that she obtains over the course of the game. The wrench can be used to do a multitude of things. Twist nuts to move objects, swing from nuts, block enemy projectiles, and much more. The wrench can be upgraded too. It eventually becomes galvanized, allowing you to do even more, like charging up and zipping across electric beams. You can even shoot on the beams. The stun gun can be shot in four directions very rapidly, and it can also be charged up to break certain barriers and deal more damage. When using it, it needs to recharge. The rolling bomb gun shoots, well, rolling bombs. The bomb is detonated after a set time, and they can be shot in any direction. Charging up the gun fires off a straight trajectory missile. Finally, the user per shot is my personal favorite. It's a four directional hyper beam that can be shot in short bursts before cooldown is necessary. However, its main gimmick is that it allows Robin to, by charging it up, switch places with an enemy or certain objects. It is such a unique idea for a weapon that allows for much more creative combat and puzzle solving opportunities. The world of Iconoclast is full of interesting locations, well-placed puzzles, creative level objects, and distinct enemies and characters. Around every corner is something to do. Little space goes unused apart from a few large open spaces reserved for cutscenes. The environments are full of personality and are extremely well crafted. 
They perfectly complement Robin's expanding arsenal. The gameplay narrow gets monotonous due to the large moveset that's acquired over time, areas of focus on different mechanics, and a large amount of unique enemies and bosses. The first area of Block Rock is an incredible tutorial area. It teaches you all of Robin's moves efficiently. Robin starts with nothing but a stun gun, and very early on she takes her father's wrench. These are the two primary tools at Robin's disposal, but the rest of her arsenal comes at a nice steady pace. I particularly like how the game guides you through a certain area until you get a certain MacGuffin, and then you use that MacGuffin to make your way back through the previous area, seeing how it can solve things in a different way or open up new paths. A perfect example of this is in Shard Wastelands after Robin gets a bomb gun, and again in a Silgar after Robin receives her electric wrench. Some areas are blocked off until you obtain a certain tool or tweak, urging you to come back later with a full arsenal of abilities. This come back later gameplay is central to many metroidvanias, urging the player to return and scan for secrets. Some hidden nooks and crannies are around too, often defined by a little indent in a wall or platform sticking out of the terrain. Every area has a variety of puzzles to solve, and no single concept or solution feels overused. All of the puzzles are fairly interesting and unique, and they make traversing the areas that much more involved. The level design complements these puzzles concisely. For example, in the Asiligar Labs, the primary focus is on detonating bombs and moving level elements. In Farrier Shockwood, it's using the electric wrench to power up moving objects and zip across wires. In the Dark Cave, it's using the electric wrench and electrified objects to light the area and make your way through. Honestly, this is one of the best aspects of the game. Their difficulty may be low in comparison to the challenge of the boss fights, but they are still satisfying to solve. Then, as I should, the puzzles culminate near the end of the game in the One Concern East, where Robin is using all of her obtained abilities, bombs, electrified objects, zip lines, and the use of her shot. I'm impressed with the full realization of mechanics, too. What does this object do? Oh, it does that! And, oh, this is used later to a greater extent. This is on par with Nintendo's game design philosophy, and it's darn near perfect. Something that isn't fully realized, at least in my opinion, is the stealth system in Farrier Shockwood with Ash. You switch between Robin and Mina and try to corner Ash without getting yourself caught. The only way to deduce his position is by his footsteps and directional dialogue, and Robin and Mina have to try to stay behind bushes to strike at the right time. I really wish this system was used more in the game. Side quests exist, most of which are back and forth or fetch quests. In Farrier Shockwood, for example, one Zaneda asks Robin to deliver a baked good to someone who's grumpy. Then the receiver doesn't want it, so you go back to Zaneda, she gives you another cake, and then she doesn't want it again, and you get a schematic out of it. There is one quest, however, that involves finding a certain character in every area of the game in a particular order. That's a bit annoying, but at least the side quests always pay off. I do like how the fast travel system is integrated, though. It might be the snazziest fast travel I have ever seen in the game. You select a destination with a wrench, then you're shot down into the center of the earth, spun around by controllers, and shot back up to your destination. Brilliant, and it fits snug into the established world. For an indie game, the world of Iconoclast was fully realized. Every aspect of it, locations, characters, history, social structure, is a tangible existence. It's not only an action platformer with astonishing art direction and animation and a story about religious corruption, Iconoclast is a microcosmic window into a complex and grounded universe. This is due to the game's incredible world building, both active and passive. By active, I refer to the game's major cutscenes, boss fights, and locations. These are moments where key plot points and character development is observed. But there is also a deeper layer of world building, one uncovered by personal observation, reading signs and logs, talking to side characters, even observing background details like the murals in the tower. They all tell tiny details that supplement the bigger picture. The player is not forced to sit through lectures that spell out exactly what is going on in the game. Some details are even left up to interpretation, a piece of stick to chew on even when the game is complete. Throughout Robin's journey, she'll encounter a great variety of enemies, from creatures, to concerned robots, to walking cacti called Crocodus. Incredibly, all enemies feel distinct. They all have varying methods of attack, some need a certain weapon to be destroyed, others can only be hit from a certain angle, and some need the projectiles deflected. Heck, some enemies can't be destroyed and act more as obstacles. Enemies and bosses drop ivory squares, which are used to refill tweaks. They also drop health too. Besides the general satisfaction and the occasional necessity to defeat enemies, the drops provide an incentive if the player is low on health or their tweaks are empty. 
the game does an excellent job of telegraphing too. Even in little things, such as a green circle popping up when an enemy can be deflected, tiny skulls arising from enemies when damaged, and tiny X's arising from enemies when a certain attack is ineffective. The animation telegraphs too. They'll wind up before an attack so you can better predict when and where they will strike. This is usually accompanied by a flash and a... Now, the boss fights in this game are a major highlight. In fact, the game boasts of its 20 plus encounters, and it even has a boss rush mode that was added sometime after the game's initial release. This boasting is entirely justified. Every boss in this game is amazing, and the creativity is off the charts. Not to mention the challenge, which right out of the gate is solid. Even on normal difficulty, the bosses could take multiple attempts, and on harder difficulties, the attempts become more and more numerous. Every boss fight is unique, and every one of them is centered around a core mechanic. No two bosses require identical strategies, whether it be interacting with the environment, the boss being invulnerable to certain attacks at certain moments, or using multiple characters with different methods of attack, whether they be playable or non-playable. One of my favorite boss fights is versus Carver in Frigger Shockwood. You're zipping around as you dodge its massive body, all the while chipping away at its giant blade. Then, afterwards, Elro joins in with his sword and jams it into the blade, at which point Robin kicks it back further and further. It's so much fun, and it's awesome how it's grinded up by the controller Mina defeats concurrently. The fights against the Silver Watchmen really test your reaction times with the wrench. The first two instances where you fight them, you have to quickly knock their katana back as they teleport behind you. Then, they're on top of the elevator, creating a tense, claustrophobic fight. It's a boss spread throughout different areas of the tower, finally culminating in their body being overtaken by an eye, like a puppet on a long, goopy string. The fight versus the Omega controller is another highlight. It takes place over multiple stages, first on a rising platform, then through an obstacle-filled corridor, and finally atop a boat sailing on the planet's spines. This isn't even the final boss, yet the complexity and variation is top-notch. I really enjoyed the fight against Mother on her panther made of rubble. Apart from its great design, I love how all the characters are running around as it pounces and slides and shoots fireballs. Robin has to swing from street lamps to avoid attacks. It's exhilarating chaos. I mentioned using multiple characters, and that's because in a few sections, Mina and Elro are playable. In one boss fight in a Siligar, you switch between using Robin and Mina's different abilities. Then Mina is playable in Fairy Shockwood, and again in One Concern East vs. Mendeleev. Elro is also playable here, versus Lawrence. Both characters are distinct from Robin. Mina is ranger with a shotgun that can be angled all around, while Elro is melee with his sword. They are not as versatile as Robin, though. For instance, Mina cannot grab onto ledges or ground pound. She can do a Mega Man power slide, though. Elro is super slow and can barely jump since you take control of him when he is very weak. He can forward thrust and block. Even though you only play as these characters for short segments, the variety is appreciated. Alright, I'm going to try and summarize the plot to the best of my abilities. I'll keep it as concise as possible, meaning I will be leaving out minor details in the deeper story themes for now. In Iconoclast, you take control of Robin, a 17-year-old mechanic from a region known as Block Rock. Robin's father, Polro, was a mechanic too, but he died shortly before the events of this game. Robin takes his place and his wrench to help out the town and fix their problems. However, under the Mighty One concern, is considered a sim to be an unregistered mechanic. For this, she must pay penance, punishment for her sins. The world of Iconoclast intertwines religion and technology to create a whole unique universe as I have never before seen. Imagine a god in the common sense, usually described as an omniscient presence, was an enormous robotic worm that roamed space. The people worship this star worm under the guidance of Mother, and she enacts his will upon the people. That's the basis for the religion of the Tri. A number of things are introduced in the first area, and through the character dialogue, the central conflicts start to come forth. For one, the penance is extreme. One man had his house destroyed, and another man had his wife executed. The one concern is cruel, corrupt, and unjust. Then, the world is running out of power. A holy substance known as ivory is the world's main source of energy, and has been dried completely. It holds all matter together, which is why the moon is fractured from overmining. On the main planet, frequent quakes remind the people that there is only so much they can mine before it will break apart. So, with the unjust one concern and the overuse of resources, the world is starting to go into chaos. I'll admit, the game throws you right into the world and expects you to pick up things quickly, but in paying attention to the dialogue and being actively involved in the game 
it can be discerned. All this being established, I'll get back to Robin. She's got red-handed by two agents when helping out her brother Elro. Her brother works as a chemist for the one concern, and there's some beef between him and Agent Black. Robin is taken captive, Elro's family and home are decimated, and this is where things really start to pick up and get serious. In jail, Robin meets Mina, a scoundrelous pirate, and the two must work together to break out. Before they escape on Mina's water scooter, however, a grenade knocks them both unconscious, and after being picked up by a ship and tossed overboard, the two are separated. Robin wakes up on the shores of Shard Wasteland, where she acquires a new weapon apart from her basic stun gun. She runs into Royal, a privileged man born of ivory, who wields magical abilities. He turns her into the nearby concern camp to prove himself, but General Chrome pays him no mind. That is, until she is listed as wanted. The agents come, and Robin is about to be killed. However, they banter on long enough that the train holding a shipment of ivory behind them starts to move, and when Royal uses his magic, it blasts Robin on top of the train. She's chased by Chrome in a helicopter, the train crashes, and Robin is knocked unconscious. But Mina finds her and Royal and decides to take them to her city home in Siligar to recover. The Issy people are seen as pirates outside of their circles, but internally, they are people that honor ancestry, family, and matrimony. Speaking of family, Mina confronts her sister Samba and mother who are angry that Mina is always away and is never able to take care of her crippled mother. Mina and Robin fall asleep after Mina shares with her the Issy values and her seeds, which destructively react with Ivory. Then the one concern invades. Shelley must go below the city to the labs and initiate the safety protocol. However, the main machine is corrupt and after battling it, the power goes out. So Mina takes Robin to the ancestral vessel where a power switch resides, where the agents confront them there. Mina kills Agent White, he explodes from the inside out, and Agent Black retreats in fear. They start up the machine for real, which moves the entire city, but Agent Black is able to escape with Samba. So Mina has to go after her. Robin chases her all the way back to Block Rock, where Mina admits she needs Robin's help to find Samba. The two search for clues, eventually encountering a Moon Man who trapped a child. Elro comes out of nowhere with a sword and slices his helmet off, and he retreats to the tower. So that's where the gang heads next. They travel through Farrier Shockwood, Elro only tagging along to protect Robin. Mina is separated from the group after a house they squatted and is leveled, so Robin and Elro, Elro more begrudgingly, go after Mina. She's down on the planet's spines, mysterious structures that cover the planet, the mechanism used to cause quakes and level houses. She takes out soldiers and a corrupted controller. Robin meets one Gustavo, a doctor, who introduces fast travel, then Robin and Elro encounter the Carver. They knock it back enough until the controller Mina defeated grinds it up, and the party is back together, albeit still bickering. As they approach the tower and realize they cannot get into it, Royal appears. Using his status, he tries to convince the guards to let them in, but they end up throwing them in holding cells instead. Robin escapes her cell, and she recovers her tools after searching the tower. However, twice she comes face to face with a mysterious watchman. More world tidbits are learned in the tower such as how its pupils, future ivory-borns like the agents, are subject to propaganda and are punished for deviancy. Robin finds a cell key, breaks out Elro and Mina, and the three of them have to find a way out. Robin receives a wrench upgrade, electrification, and she soon finds herself observing an odd stage show where a deviant pupil is humiliated. The one concerns and forced beliefs are crystal clear, only in compliance do we maintain our verity. As the group reaches the elevator, the Watchman shows up again, and they make their way to the top of the tower. Some higher-ups fear the end times are near because a Star Worm is approaching due to the overmining of Ivory. Agent Black is interrogating Samba, so Elro uses his one concern keycard and goes in alone. Black shoots him square in the chest, then furthers his agony by ripping off his arm. Before she is able to finish him, Chrome steps in and says Elro will be dealt with another way, but before he can say any more, Black points her gun at Robin. Suddenly, the Watchman flies out of nowhere and saves Robin by zooming her off out the window. Samba escapes with Mina, and they open up the door for the pupils. The two have a heart-to-heart, -heart, where Mina admits Robin is giving her a chance to accomplish something, and Mina will return home later. Samba goes home, while Mina goes after Robin. Robin awakes in a dark cave. After trekking through it, she confronts the Watchman again, but he is overwhelmed by blue eyes that are attached to his ivory form. Royal drops in out of nowhere and annoyingly drowns the Watchman, and afterwards the two make their way out into the mountain. It's steep, windy, and snowy. In searching for a safe resting place, 
they come across a transcender, one of the many machines that imbue select individuals with ivory. Those who are strong enough and survive to be reborn often lose limbs and have imperfections. They become the agents, enforcers of divine doctrine. Those pure and perfect, like mother and royal next in line, are chosen to rule the people and act as a medium between God and humanity. Authority is not based on merit in this society, it's based on luck. Robin and Royal find the boat captain Myron in the cave, the one who threw Robin and Mina off the boat. He's stranded on the mountain and warns of something lurking beneath. Royal says they can defeat it, and they find themselves in a vault of controllers. Thinking it a misplaced holy relic, Royal accidentally activates the Omega controller. It's up to Robin to fend it off as it chases her through corridors. Eventually, Myron's boat crashes down and rides the planet's spines. With Royal's help, it explodes, blasting everyone up through the mountain. Myron leaves to finish mapping the continent. It was the controller who was shifting land and disrupting his progress. Robin and Royal reach one concerned west, and Royal heads in while Robin is said to wait. She wanders off to find Mina in a big coat, and the two go to Gustavo for help on breaking into one concerned west. After finding pupils either frightened or amazed at the outside world, Gustavo waits at the tower entrance. He does not offer his own help, but directs them towards one Ash. Ash agrees to tell them, but only if they prove their strength, which they do, and Ash says that the cameras outside the One Concerned West only detect humans, so Mina uses her bulky and human coat to get them in. Upon entering, a chemical contra reveals herself to be Tegan, a friend of Elro's. Elro is awaiting execution. A story sequence then plays, which explains the strife between Agent Black and Elro. Being a chemist, Elro created a serum that burns ivory bloods, and he plans to use it to eliminate the higher-ups who ban the use of alternate power. Overmining is destroying the planet, yet they refuse to budge. You get it. He uses a serum on an Agent Grey, probably the nicest laid-back agent, when she approaches him close about the death of his father. She burns from the inside out, and Elro escapes thanks to the chemical contra. Back with Robin, after she makes her way through the upper facility, she obtains the usurper shot, and the two find that the ancestral vessel is being deconstructed and vandalized by the concern. Mina and Robin get separated momentarily while Robin has to defeat a mech, and afterwards the two find a chamber of transcenders. Gruesomely, below the transcenders are piles of bones and ivory dust from those pupils who died. Royals in a holding cell of detritus dust, detritus, detritus dust, that doesn't allow him to use magic, and Robin and Mina break him out. Then, they overhear a congregation. The concern of planning to launch a rocket to the moon. The chrome is blunt and admits that the concern is just leaving all their soldiers on the planet to die, while the ivory bloods and the higher-ups escape, and he blames everything on Royal. Agent Black snaps and pummels Chrome until he bleeds. Chrome's battalion and the other soldiers engage in a firefight. Dead soldiers abound, Royal wants to make his way to City 1 to confront Mother. Agent Black blocks his path in a room of Detritus Dust, and there she degrades him before knocking him out. Robin runs in and is trapped with Black, and Mina tries to interfere, but she is knocked out too, so Robin must overcome Black herself. Afterwards, Robin drags in conscious bodies onto the shuttle platform, and after they awake, they eventually ride the shuttle. Chrome arrives on the platform, still alive, announcing that he is the only one who knows the truth and can unite everybody under his cause. His confidence increases when someone shoots one of Elro's serums at him and it does nothing. Robin, Mina, and Royal stop at One Concern East and find Elro super weak. Royal says that Mother can heal him, so they take him along. Royal is not permitted in City 1, so Robin has to find a way in. They make their way through the city and eventually reach Mother who is parading amongst the citizens. Royal confronts her, but she has a hard time keeping her composure and acts as if everything is fine to maintain her image. Royal pleads for her to absolve Elro of his sins, then Mina gets angry as she believed Elro would literally be healed. Mother disowns Royal and completely loses her temper, saying that he is the root of all problems and that she will go on the rocket as she is above everyone else. When Mina puts her on an equal level, she decides to crush them by transforming her float into a giant panther. You have challenged the very ground you walk on, she says. Royal holds back giant rocks as Robin deals damage, and it ends with Mina's seeds. Royal collapses as she slowly dies, then Chrome and his goons show up. He says Mother has gone awry keeping secrets. Chrome announces himself heir, 
Mother explodes into a giant ivory tree, and the revolution begins as Chrome Loyal Soldiers and Mother Loyal Soldiers fire at each other. The group finds safety in the Bastion as the city plunges into chaos. Everyone is weak and distraught. Mina questions her faith since the Issy contributed to the Ivory Crisis. Robin goes off on her own. She finds Chrome with an old Ivory born, and Chrome asks Robin to sit. He lays out his goals to her. He wants to get rid of the hierarchical structure and establish equality, and that begins with killing all idols and heroes. He shoots the old man and explains that Robin's actions have caused people to look up to her, so she must be eliminated as well. Before he can, Elro enters and inserts a syringe in Chrome. Of course, Chrome believes it will do nothing to him, but because it contained the activation agent, Chrome burns. He freaks out, runs onto the balcony, and explodes. With the approach of the Starworm and ensuing chaos, everybody wants to go home. At One Concern East, they find Tegan. Everybody is fighting for the rocket. Royal proposes taking the rocket to the moon to speak with the Starworm, and he needs Robin to work the rocket with him and Mina and Elro at the two-person activation system. Elro initially refuses, but after Tegan offers to take his place, he goes. The crew splits up between three floors. A cutaway shows three new Reborns, Mendeleev, Noble, and Lawrence. They are tasked with protecting the rocket. With Mina, she fights her way through and faces Mendeleev and her combustion abilities. Mina defeats her and waits at the switch for Elro. Back with Robin, she and Royal split up to find a disc with a password to access the rocket. Robin finds a group of imprisoned chemical Contra, and Noble swoops in with her teleportation and invisibility powers and nabs the chemical ventilation key, spreading noxious gas throughout the room. After defeating Noble Bomberman style, she receives the password from the Contra. She and Royal meet up and use white tickets to access the launch platform. These tickets were introduced in the tower, but they're never really explained apart from being necessary to access certain places. Elro, slow and weak, encounters Lawrence. He sticks his sword in his back after defeating him for good measure. Robin and Royal make it onto the rocket platform but get stuck on an elevator. Agent Black shows up with a bazooka, and Robin must fight to activate switches and get the elevator working again. Black again stands in the way at the base of the rocket. She was closest to Agent Grey, but now that Grey was killed by Elro, she has nothing left but the rocket, and she will only give it up over her dead body. Using seeds, Robin degrades her further and further. Eventually, eyes latch onto Black, transforming her into a beast of ivory. Even it will not let go of the rocket, but Robin defeats it, Royal says they had no other choice, and they enter the code and wait for Mina and Elro to pull the switches. But Elro refuses. He is about to leave, and as the situation escalates, Mina threatens to shoot him if he does. He continues, so Mina has to shoot him in the leg. Somehow, Elro pushes a switch, and the rocket is off to Midway, a holy sanctuary on the smaller of the two moons. Robin and Royal make their way through the modules into the interception dome. Royal pleads for the Starworm to have mercy on the people and the planet. Royal gets desperate when the Starworm doesn't communicate, and ends up busting a hole in it. The Starworm retaliates by putting a spell on Royal and punching a hole in the glass. Robin must carry Royal to safety before all the air is gone. He feels like a failure. She is forced to leave him behind when one of the door sensors are disconnected, and she takes a pod back to the planet. She lands next to her house, crawls out, and breaks down for the first time. Mina comes and comforts her, confronting her own selfishness through the reflection of Robin's kindness. She assures Robin that she didn't fail anybody. She did all she could. Elro just wants Robin to stay home and accept her fate, but she climbs down into the Star Arms impact zone to confront him. After he sucks some ivory from the planet, Robin stands tall and punches him. Then she's hit with his spell. She faces the monsters inside her own head, overcoming her fears by extending sunflowers. Then she confronts her father. I didn't mention the rest of the pull roll memories since this is basically the only important one. The player can choose to walk out on Polro and leave behind his wish for Robin to live a quiet life, or they can choose to accept it by embracing him. Either way, Robin overcomes, to the surprise of the Starworm. He unleashes a fury, and afterwards, its head opens up to reveal it was piloted by some bird mechanic. He squawks at Robin, informing her he's low on ivory. All this time, 
a being thought as a divine was just a machine harvesting planetary resources. Robin fights the bird, and in the climax of the fight, he reactivates the starworm, but it just ends up crushing his head, and that's that. The starworm explodes, releasing ivory and revitalizing life, then Robin returns home and goes straight to bed, and Elro says he won't tell her what to do anymore. The credits roll, and alongside the credits are little cinematics that show what the characters are up to. So that's the layout and plot of Iconoclast, condensed somewhat. I still tried to add some depth, so this is far from a synopsis. But, like I said, I excluded all the fun minutia. Go give the game a play if you want to delve into further details yourself. But dang, what a packed experience this game is. I love the world building and character building, humorous moments, the serious moments, the melancholy moments, and the heartbreaking moments. Speaking of humor, there's actually a great amount of it. The game relies mostly on a lot of quick, witty lines. Characters exchange banter, some humorous events occur, and some comic characters recur. Songbird does an excellent job of balancing the seriousness of the world with his humorous moments. I feel like a good chunk of it comes from Mina. Her sassy attitude, forward nature, and thrill for adventure merge into a character that is severely flawed, yet these same traits lead to an incredible comic relief. And the pacing. The story unfolds at a steady rhythm, characters' motivations gradually being revealed. Some moments may drag on for a while, like the stage show, but for the most part, story events are kept fairly concise and are not overbearing. It's not the type of story-driven game to keep you locked in cutscenes for 20 minutes to slowly explain some important plot detail. The game does a great job of feeding you world details bit by bit, but it doesn't directly explain and wrap up one thing. What is the deal with the Starworm? Why are there controllers, planet spines, and an elevator down to the planet's core? What's the deal with the blue eyes, and why did they spread everywhere? Sure, you could pass it off as, that's the way the world is, but that's no fun. So I'll try to explain things the best I can, for my sake and the collective sake of anyone who's interested. So the eyes. From the very first shot of the game they are seen, the blue barnacle looking pustules. As Robin progresses in her adventure, more is discovered about them. Most notably, they are attracted to ivory. They are seen corrupting ivory-filled controllers. The Issy harvests the ivory from within them, and they are seen latching onto ivory bloods like the Silver Watchman in Agent Black. But where do they come from? The first hint, from what I recall, is when the Omega controller releases some little red beam into space. It seems odd at that point. Then later, when battling the Starworm at the impact zone, its head seems to be filled with the eyes. But the final confirmation comes with the bird mechanic who uses a remote to summon the eyes and create enemies. Undoubtedly, the bird created these eyes or brought them from its home planet, its goal being sucking as much ivory from the planet as possible and transmitting it back to the Starworm. As for the controllers and planet spines, they were most likely created by the Starworm, or the bird, too. A piece of some engraving underneath Blockrock shows the Starworm with some controllers and the fact that the one concern did not create them, only harness them, further supports this. Where else will this so-called divine technology derive? The destruction that the planet spines and the controllers cause is misidentified as penance. The purpose of the spines may have been to hold the world together when so much ivory is missing, as the spine of a book holds its pages together. It is my belief that the Star Worm put in place these measures to protect the ivory. don't need me to tell you that, visually, this game is gorgeous. Sure, gorgeous or stunning are subjective terms, but I don't think a sane person can view a screenshot and say, eh, that looks subpar. Indie games are saturated with pixel-based graphics, mostly because it's easier to work with, but Iconoclast is truly on another level. Its art and animation is some of the best I have seen in indie gaming full stop. But I have to admit, I'm not very knowledgeable when it comes to evaluating the quality of the game's art. I don't have the credibility. So what I'll do instead is leave the subjective evaluation to you, the viewer. Throughout this video you've seen clips from all over the game, so I'm sure you have a grasp on the visual style and the quality of animation by now. If not, playing the game and paying attention to those details can visually inform you. I do want to say that the animation in the game is an excellent case study though. Robin sprites alone are a perfect example of how to create an expressive, versatile, well-rounded player character. The animation in other departments is excellent too. The environments, the other characters, 
the bosses, the particles and effects, and the user interface. A major quality that defines the sound of Iconoclast is its stylistic consistency. Everything fits within its own bubble, if that makes sense. But it's hard to pinpoint the reasons why it's consistent. I'm not a sound engineer or a music producer, so I can't comment on it a lot. In terms of sound effects, though, I can say that they are super satisfying. Robin's pitter-patter of her shoes, the sound of the weapons, punching, deflecting, winding up the wrench, navigating the menu, the enemy detects you noise, the chunky impacts, even the damage noise and subsequent losing of a tweak. It all works so well together in game. The stylistic consistency can also be applied to the soundtrack. It's varied in rhythm, mood, instrumentation, and music style, which is good. At the same time, the types of instruments used, mainly synths, and the structure of the songs create a sense of consistency. I think. I'm not a music theorist. Filtered mechanical samples litter the soundtrack, creating consistency that fits with the game's identity. In this one stink, electric guitar complements a lot of boss themes. But the soundtrack as a whole did not blow me away, says the person that purchased it for this video. Okay, I'm a hypocrite, but hear me out. When framed by the rest of the game, it is great. But on its own, it's okay. This may be because, on its lonesome, you focus on the quality of the music, but when playing the game, you focus on how well it fits. Not to say the soundtrack is of poor quality, there are some very memorable melodies in there. The title theme, block rock, shard wastelands, and a number of boss themes. But most of the music left my head, even after two playthroughs. It made an impression on the here and now, but not afterwards. And this is just a personal opinion, but I think what makes a great game soundtrack is memorability. Though, memorability is subjective. Someone out there could hum 30 of the tracks in this game. I don't know, you might disagree with me, but that's okay. So, in the plot summary, I talked about the main characters, Robin, Mina, Elro, Royal, Black, Chrome, but I want to dive deeper into the characters, determine how they change throughout the game if they do, and how they contribute to the game thematically. Robin's character development revolves around the comments of her close friends and family, and it takes the entire duration of the game for it to be fully realized, as it should. Of course, Robin is helpful. It's a stagnant trait that is always certain, but this helpfulness is also what gets her into trouble. Both her brother and father wish for Robin to settle down and lead a quiet life. Elro because he cares for her safety, and Polaro because he wants Robin to put the family first. Though Robin proves time and time again that her commitment to aiding those in need has been pivotal in literally saving the world. And not all of her actions are easy choices. To kill Agent Black when she so desperately holds onto the rocket is clearly troubling when taken with Royal's assertion, and so too is her choice to either leave or hug her father in her memory after the spell. Speaking of the spell, the grey dreamscape she is sent to is a culmination of her fears. Raising up the grotesque sunflowers symbolizes the overcoming of her fears. A destroyed home, the deaths of those she loves, the collapse of society. It's an obscure symbolic self-confrontation that leaves a player stunned and Robin's journey complete. Elro takes a sharp end of the stick throughout the course of the game. His family and house are destroyed by penance, he loses an arm to Black, he loses an eye at some point, and he's shot in the leg by Mina. Safe to say, he is really, really, really beat up in the end. Even playing as him in One Concern East shows how slow and weathered he becomes. Despite all of this, the main struggle he faces throughout the game's plot is letting Robin go. Of course, he wants her to settle down, and he believes his actions are only in her best interests, and it's his duty to protect her. After losing so much, I don't blame him. He doesn't want the only family he has left to run off into trouble and get herself killed. It is only after Robin proves her independence by defeating the Star Worm that Elro says he will no longer stand in her way. Being a very expressive and talkative character, Mina's development is fairly clear. She struggles with being there for her family. The Issy have rooted values in ancestry, matrimony, and procreation, but Mina is an outlier. 
She has a thirst for adventure and wants to explore the world and take it on herself. However, that does not sit well with her sister and mother. Her mother is crippled and needs assistance, for which Mina cannot be there, and Samba simply cannot spend much time with Mina with her scurrying about. One aspect of her struggle is resolved in Robin. She is able to take on the world and the agents with her. She realizes that she cannot always rely on herself. Then, when she believes that the world is about to end, Mina wants to spend any time she has left with her family, so for once, she is present when it matters, and even in the credits she is seen reconnecting with Samba. Royal goes from an egoist and a firm believer that it is his birthright to be royal by his blood, to discovering that royalty is a lot darker than he thought, and that ivory running through his veins does not automatically make him an angel. Merit over blood. Then, through black, he learns that he has been privileged his whole life, and he has never experienced pain, rejection, and fear. His character arc wraps up in the saddest way possible, lack of a will to live after learning he was living a lie. As for Black, I don't think any game has ever made you feel so guilty for killing the main antagonist. Through the course of the game, she is portrayed as constantly upset and fed up with everything. Puzzle pieces are laid out bit by bit, little clues here and there, but the bulk of her character development occurs at the rocket. Her transcendence went awry and she's constantly in pain. Elro destroys her only comfort and Robin destroys her only escape. You start to understand her pain and empathize with her, so it's legitimately sad to have to kill her as she's clutching onto the only thing she has left. Chrome is interesting. He shows that someone well-read in religious scripture can interpret it in their own way and amass a cult following, almost like an extremist denomination. Chrome thinks his beliefs to be the only correct ones and that only he and his admirers see the truth. In the climax of the game, you learn that Chrome's plan was to rid of all leaders and establish a society where everyone sees each other as equal. Sounds pleasing, but his method of accomplishing it involves numerous life sacrifices and complete abolition of current society. His character doesn't change much, so it's fitting that he meets his end by expecting a previous outcome. Polaro has some character development too, but of course it ties into Elro and Robin. From my observations, his purpose in the plot is to show what happens to somebody who would rather accept their fate than take a charge against it. It's like that famous Dumbledore quote, you must choose between what is easy and what is right. In Polro's case, he went for what was easy, and Elro thought him weak because he didn't choose what would have been the right thing to do, stand up for the one concern. That leads Elro to develop his ivory burning serum, doing what his father couldn't. There are some minor characters who are developed a bit, such as Mina's mother Minora, Ash, Tolo, and Agent Grey, but they are not worth mentioning, I don't think. All these characters say more about the characters they have relations to anyways, such as Minora's anger at Mina's absence and Agent Grey's importance to Black. Iconoclast tackles quite a few themes, all of which can be deciphered through the characters, their interactions, and world building. Now, I won't be boring you by reviewing every single thematic element, but I want to highlight the primary themes and those that I personally found telling. First of all, the game's title. An iconoclast is someone who goes against established beliefs, and there could not be a better descriptor for Robin in a ragtag band. Heretics, maybe. Rebels. But those don't have an A in them, see? You need to incorporate that try. Speaking of the try, it is seen all over. Around City 1, of course. On everything One Concern related. Mother is seen holding the try. There are depictions of people making a triangle with their hands. Alright, but what does it mean? Well, the stage show in the tower tells. The three sides represent the parents, the guardians, and the people. So mother, those born of ivory like the agents, and the common people. This is super reminiscent of the Trinity, a Christian doctrine that defines God as three parts, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So the try is based on this idea but adapted into a social structure. Okay, cool trivia, but what is the main theme of iconoclasts? My best guess is religious and societal corruption. From the very beginning, the deeds of the One Concern are questionable, but as you uncover more and more, the corruption gets deeper and deeper. The Penance, deciding what is and what isn't sinful. The Tower, the Propaganda, the fake Black Plague. The Lies, interconcerned secrecy. The Ivory-topped social structure. Those who survive a dangerous rebirth by pure dumb luck are the ones who lead the people and are above everyone else unjustly. In fact, ivory denotes privilege. The concept of an ivory tower describes a place that is cut off from outside realities. City One and the institutions surrounding Mother are exactly this. Adherence to established methods, ivory, and the reluctance to go forward with better ideas, alternate energy, ultimately leads to overmining and the destruction of the moon and near destruction of the planet. 
All of this is made even worse when you realize the entire religion is baseless. The Starworm is not a god, it's just some mechanized thing that only uses the planet to farm ivory. It didn't select ivoryborns. It didn't set up the social structure. It's all a misunderstanding propagated by rationalization, trying to make a sense of a worm in space and the stuff he spawned on the planet. So, from that long-winded explanation, you can see that the theme of corruption seeps into every aspect of this world. The theme of the importance of family also permeates through multiple characters. Robin is told by her father to put family before anything else, and Elro already exhibits this idea by only following Robin's adventure to keep her safe. After losing so much family, Robin is all he has left, and he can't let her go. Mina is in a similar boat, although her family is at least still alive. She's always away from her family and is never there for them, so she's scrutinized for it. Yet, because the main characters drift away from their family's wishes, the message here is that your family doesn't have to define you. Now, I mentioned the overmining of ivory and the ignorance of alternative energy. This is an obvious parallel to the real world. The over-reliance on fossil fuels is analogous to ivory. Except for the fact that, here on Earth, I don't think coal and oil are seen as holy substances, nor do they act as a strong nuclear force, but you get my point. In the game, the reason Elro is against the One Concern is not because of the death of his father, but their stubbornness to adapt. The Chemical Contra are a group within the concerned chemists trying to develop alternative energy. Their work pays off in the credits, where they set up a machine that resembles a turbine which harnesses the natural energy of Farrier Shockwood. Now, here's a primary thing I took away from this game, the deeper message that I believe Sonberg intended. You don't need a god to have a purpose in life. The absurdity of the religion centered around the Starworm and its clear baselessness reflects his real thoughts. That religion as a whole is a series of misunderstandings derived from humanity's need to rationalize the unrationalizable, explain the unexplainable. They cannot simply let the unknown be forever unknown in their eyes. There is some reason, some purpose, right? Like Royal coming to terms with his perceived meaningless existence at Midway. There must be a reason he was chosen, right? Not a mere fabrication by humanity, right? That can't be the case. Yet it is. And like Royal, I've come to terms with this too. And I'm sure Sonberg did as well. Why else would he insert this personal theme into his game? And though it may be hard to come to terms with, there you are. No higher power. No life after death. No purpose, except the purpose you craft for yourself. With your limited lifespan, why bother devoting your life to something entirely intangible? Define yourself. Be an iconoclast if it gives you resolve. I guess that's my deeper takeaway from the game anyway. And you'd never guess this, but this is the only game that has gotten me to think this deep on these matters. When does a 16-bit metroidvania get you to question your own existence? It's absurd, but in a fantastic way. If you've stuck with me this far, you one or two people, you probably found something interesting in here. Maybe you clicked on this video because you too like Iconoclasts and want to see someone else talk about it. Or maybe you are intrigued about what truly makes a Metroidvania masterpiece. Whatever the case, thanks. I would conclude this video essay, but nobody sticks around for that. Besides, I just end up rambling on again about every aspect of this game. I'm terrible at slimming things down, you saw it with my plot summary. As I've said before, Iconoclasts compelled me to talk about it. If a game strikes me in such a way as this one, there is no way I'll let my thoughts pile up in the back of my head, no matter how much work it is to produce something like this. I adore this game. Iconoclast truly is a Metroidvania masterpiece, and it rightly belongs on my shelf as one of my all-time favorites.